Debate rages over when the New Testament biographies of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John were written down. The sagely source Wikipedia it offers the standard dating put forward by a coalition of scholars over the last hundred or so years. Almost universally, critical scholars say the Gospel of Mark was penned first, dating it sometime just after 70 AD. Given the popular thesis that Matthew and Luke both have literary dependence on Mark, these Gospels are then usually dated somewhere in the 80s AD. And that leaves John's Gospel, almost entirely unique in its composition and content, to bring up the rear, somewhere in around 90 AD. Given that Jesus died around 30 or 33 AD, that puts a range of roughly 40 to 60 years after the events that they describe. Now, the skeptical New Testament scholar Bart Ehrman claims that this is late enough to allow for theological legend to develop, and that this timeline is basically settled in scholarship, with only diehard evangelicals defending earlier dates for the Gospels in a bid to close that gap between the events of Jesus' life and their written record. So where does the evidence of history point when it comes to dating these biographies? Or when were the Gospels written? Now first up, even if we were to accept Ehrman's timeline, uh, that does nothing to undermine why you can take the Gospels seriously. For starters, there are independent arguments, both for traditional authorship of the Gospels by those amongst the apostolic community, and for their historical reliability as biographies penned by people close to the details of the events and people who are habitually truthful in their reportage. So if you have questions about either of those, please check out the extra videos we have linked down below. But the truth is, 40 to 60 years, that's still within living memory of the events that they describe. I mean, it's not like these life-changing stories about Jesus' teaching and miracles and death and resurrection were kept quiet until the Gospels were penned, with then the authors having to strain latent memories. No, uh, these Jesus stories were not only significant enough to be easily remembered, but that memory was kept fresh through constant retelling and, as Acts describes, memorization amongst the early Christians. There was even a living apostolic community of eyewitnesses available to guard against misremembering, people motivated to preserve the veracity of what they'd seen and heard in giving testimony to Jesus. So this standard dating, it's not a problem for the Gospels. Ehrman has to make his case that these accounts are full of legendary development and that the oral preservation of these stories is unreliable against all the weight of evidence which suggests otherwise. Second, a mounting number of scholars have pointed out that the standard dating for the Gospels, it's built on shaky foundations. The major argument as to why Mark's Gospel was written supposedly after 70 AD amounts to nothing more than a skeptical assumption. Namely that in Mark 13, Jesus so accurately predicts the siege of Jerusalem that would take place when Titus brought down the Jewish revolt in AD 70, that Jesus' words, they must be an instance of what scholars call vaticinium ex eventu, or prophecy after the fact. To put it simply, because skeptical scholars don't accept who Jesus claims to be in the Gospels, there is no way he could supernaturally predict the future. And as such, any accurate prophecy, that has to be attributed to later Gospel authors retroactively putting the details of Jerusalem's destruction onto Jesus' lips, maybe in a bid to prop up his messianic credentials. But there are serious problems with this skeptical assumption. All three synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark and Luke, record some version of Jesus' Olivet Discourse, or his predictions of Jerusalem's downfall. But if these passages are all concocted by the authors after Jerusalem's destruction in the summer of AD 70, then some of the words they deceptively attribute to Jesus, they would make no sense. Why, for instance, would Mark chapter 13 verse 18 have Jesus' disciples to pray this doesn't happen in winter? Or why would Matthew 24 verse 10 have Jesus telling his disciples to pray that it doesn't happen on a Sabbath? As New Testament scholar Dale Allison writes, what would be the point of inserting an imperative to pray about a past event? Something made all the more weird by Jesus' mention of winter and the Sabbath when, according to the skeptics, the Gospel authors should know already full well that Jerusalem's destruction happened on neither of these. So the details just don't fit the narrative. Moreover, if Jerusalem really was destroyed by the time these synoptic Gospels were written, why would the authors not capitalize on the supposed fulfillment of Jesus' prophecy by drawing the links explicitly, as they do elsewhere in their corpus to bolster prophetic credentials? The author of Luke and Acts, for instance, does this with Agabus in Acts 11, 27 to 28, justifying his prophetic office by establishing how his predictions of a severe famine had come true. So the skeptical thesis, it just doesn't fit the evidence that we have in the Gospels. But third and finally, there are good reasons to think that at least the Synoptic Gospels predate AD 70. Take the standard order of the Gospels composition, Mark first, then Matthew, then Luke, then John. Uh, whilst the early church fathers disagree with this assessment, putting Matthew first, it doesn't change the following argument, because the simple reality is that Luke and Acts, they function as a two-volume work penned by the same author. 
But Acts, which recounts scenes of the early church over the first three decades, that book closes with Paul the Apostle under house arrest in Rome, awaiting trial before the Emperor around 62 AD. Now, as the history focuses on Peter and Paul, and which chronicles the martyrdoms of less significant figures like Stephen the deacon and James the son of Zebedee, if this account had been penned in the early 80s AD, then you would expect it to include a number of important events that are conspicuously absent. Like Peter's martyrdom, hinted at the end of John's Gospel and chronicled in Clement of Rome's letter to the Corinthians around 96 AD. Or Paul's martyrdom, also retold by Clement in the same letter. Or the martyrdom of James, the Lord's brother and leader of the church in Jerusalem, whose death is recorded by Josephus in Book 20 of his Antiquities of the Jews. Now, given these are three of the most senior figures in the early Christian movement, you can make a legitimate argument from silence here that it makes no sense for their martyrdoms in the mid to late 60s AD to go unmentioned if Acts was penned in the 80s AD, whereas it does make sense if Acts was penned in the early 60s AD, which means Luke would have to be earlier, Matthew sometime in the late 50s AD, and Mark even earlier, pushing back perhaps to the late 40s AD, which would close the gap between Jesus' life here on earth and his written record down to about 10 to 40 years. And that's just the beginning. Paul seemingly quotes Luke's Gospel, chapter 10, verse 7, in his first epistle to Timothy, chapter 5, verse 18, meaning Luke would have to be penned by the mid-60s AD when Paul wrote this. The patristics like Irenaeus, a student of Polycarp who was a disciple of John the Apostle, they offer a wealth of testimony, saying that Matthew penned his Gospel while Paul and Peter were still preaching in Rome, again, somewhere in the early 60s AD. And when you try and account for Jesus' teaching, assuming the temple's existence all along the way, there is a wealth of arguments that support early dating or pre-80-70 dating for at least the Synoptic Gospels. The reality is, the Gospels don't come with dates on them, but they do come with traditional names on them. So don't be concerned when skeptics claim you can't take these Gospels seriously because they're written too late. Because not only do we have great reasons to think they're written earlier than the skeptics take them, but even if you adopt the standard timeline, the independent evidence of authorship and of historical reliability gives you every reason to trust what these Gospels say about Jesus. Dan here from Questioning Christianity. Thanks so much for checking us out. We are all about helping you connect the Christian story to life's deepest questions. So if you're enjoying the content, make sure you subscribe and click the bell on YouTube and then go ahead and follow us on socials.